While China is making strides in chip manufacturing, there's one key part of the process that is eluding them. The lithography machines required to project and print chip developers' designs onto a wafer are so complex and expensive that only three companies in the world can produce them. But China says it is making inroads in developing its own technology. So how close is China to closing the final gap in its push for chip manufacturing self-sufficiency? Well, let's go to Washington, D.C. to ask Stephen Ezel, Vice President of Global Innovation Policy at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, and Ray Wang, Research Director of her Semiconductors Supply Chain and Emerging Tech at Futurum. Thank you again, gentlemen, for being part of this program. Stephen, I'm going to start with you before we get to the technicalities. Let's talk about money here. China has created a chip investment fund to the tune of about $50 billion to go into chip design, innovation, manufacturing. Where is that money going? Yes, this is the third iteration of the big fund. Uh, this newest phase three of the big fund uh, from 2024 to 2039, as you said, intends to invest some $48 billion into China's semiconductor ecosystem. Uh, in this iteration, they're focusing investments in perceived bottleneck areas, including lithography systems um, uh, and uh, high bandwidth memory chips and advanced AI chip technologies. Uh, China, quote, wants to be able to build AI capable semiconductors with outside assistance. Um, that appears to be the goal of this uh, third phase of investment. It's interesting now that these investments appear to be targeting the very most uh, technologically complex, the most difficult parts of the semiconductor uh, production ecosystem. Uh, it's in a way smart that China would target these real bottlenecks. Um, in a way, it's also, I, I think, um, a sign that they recognize that these are the areas where they have made the least amount of progress in the past quarter century. Ray, uh, how concerned should Taiwan be about this, and what's your your take on on China's focus? Yeah, I think, you know, when significant investment that being pure in all this area, including HBM, AI chips like GPU or ASICs, um, and apparently lithography, I think it does raise concern. But I think the problem here is how much advancement can China make, right? We are saying lithography, this is a place that I, I will argue that China was is still probably about 10 years, even 15 years behind compared to ASML's machine. Right. I think on that part, it's not like, hey, like I'm going to pour $100 billion in there and we can make significant progress within five years. This is beyond just like investment, right? It requires a lot of technical complexity, requires a lot of talents that have experience, in, experience working in SML or Nikon, like other lithography related companies, right? This is very complicated work. I will say, you know, the, the place that China could potentially make advancement will probably be HBM, given their advancement, their progress in DRAM. That's the part I can see some uh, advancement, but, you know, given other leading memory companies, the progress they are making, it takes seven years, it takes five years to make. I, I will assume that it will still take a couple of years for CSMT, which is the leading Chinese DRAM makers, to make some you know notable progress in HBM, which is a leading, which is a memory for AI chips like GPU or ASICs. Before we move on, I want to break down uh, the the issue of lithography for our viewers, as um, it's one of the most critical components of semiconductor ecosystem. Now, microchips are made by building up layers of interconnected patterns on a silicon wafer, and the method used to create these patterns are called lithography. It dictates the performance and functionality of the chips. Now, the global photolithography equipment market is dominated by three major players, ASML, Nikon, and Canon. The Dutch firm ASML is the absolute market leader with 61.2% of the global market share in 2024. And according to the Taiwan-based Semiconductor Industry Research Institution, Semivision. Now, notably, ASML is the world's only supplier of cutting-edge extreme ultraviolet lithography or EUV machines necessary 
to manufacture the world's most advanced chips. That's according to market researcher Yol Intelligence, and that was in the third quarter of 2024. EUV lithography accounted for nearly 40% of ASML's overall system sales. Now, that's a very simplistic overview of that lithography uh, sector. Um, going back to you, Ray, uh, China is investing, and you, you kind of touched, touched on this. They're investing in domestic tools like, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, SMEE's SSA 800 lithography uh, system, which you did mention just now. But can you just explain how, how, and you said that China's then 10 to 15 years behind, but can you explain perhaps the potential of that and if any other country is coming close to, to trying to create that kind of technology to become self-sufficient? Yeah, I think in terms of lithography, I think I still think there's significant hurdles there for Chinese semiconductor industry to overcome. Um, if you look at, uh, let's say, you know, one of the, the notable lithography maker, the the one that worked with Huawei closely called Side Carrier, one of the latest equipment they released, the lithography machine is actually designed for 28 nanometers. And the spec of that is similar to ASML's 1970 series. And ASML released that machine that could, I think was back to around 2012 or 2011, right? So that's about like 13 or 12 years gap between the, the market leaders and the Chinese equipment makers, right? So on that front, I think there's still significant gap between the market leaders and also Chinese equipment makers. So I think I think on that front still have significant progress that Chinese memory Chinese uh, semiconductor industry need to make. Uh, but Stephen, larger node chips are still needed for much of the electronics we use, many many of the technologies we use. So even getting to that level, doesn't that move China a bit closer to be able to manage its own ecosystem and not have to rely perhaps too much on the Western technologies? Yeah, certainly all across the board, you know, import substitution and domestic capacity is a goal of Chinese of Chinese strategy here. Yeah, I mean, you know, Shanghai Microelectronics uh, has claimed that in 2023, they developed a EUV machine that's capable of 28 nanometers. Yeah, as I said earlier, I think they can be competitive uh, in this mature node space. And, and that goes on the the lithography and the foundry side of that, um, that it, will that be a threat to Taiwan, to India, to other parts of the world that want to play in this mature node space? Yes, absolutely. Um, but that's why uh, this industry uh, is uh, marked by Moore's law, right? It's uh, marked by doubling the capacity and uh, capabilities of these chips every two years. And if China wants to be truly competitive in the global semiconductor industry, that's the trajectory they're going to have to get on. Um, I, again, I, 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 I think they can compete in, in this legacy marketplace effectively, um, but can they compete on leading edge? I don't think so. And that's why the, uh, the core objective for companies and countries uh, like Taiwan is going to have to be migrating up the value chain to play in the higher end of this ecosystem. Right. And speaking of um, the higher end of the value chain, China says... Uh, it's making progress in seven nanometer and five nanometer chips. I mean, still not, not close to where TSMC is at, but particularly by SMIC and Huawei. And, and it's catching some attention, Ray. Can you tell us where they are at advanced chips? Yeah, I think I will still case, um, you know, some of the cautious caution regarding the five nanometers advancement that, you know, some of the media is claiming. I do think SMIC has made uh, notable advancement in terms of seven, seven nanometer chips, especially the process technology that designed uh, for the smartphone chips like Huawei's Chilling uh, 90, 20 series or 19 series. I think the yield of that will, will actually be quite commercially viable. I think the problem for kind of SMIC in general in terms of seven, seven nanometers is the yield and the capacity when whether that it's number one, commercially not viable, and number two, can they fit the quality that customer want, right? And I don't think make at this point they are they have this they have significant capacity 
in terms of standard nanometers, they can go to the AI chips, right? Like um, manufacture tons of AI chips from Huawei's SN series, uh, SN series GPU, like 910B or 910C. Then, you know, the reason behind all of this YAL or capacity issues is for no well, number one, uh, SMIC basically manufactures semi nanometers chips without EUV. They are using DUV that using the self aligning quadruple mounting pattern to do the seven nanometer chips. Right, so that will face significant yaw problems and harder for them to scale out of productions. Uh, Stephen, I'm curious to find out where what is driving this innovation, uh, given the fact that. Uh, the U.S. and 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 other uh, kind of Western countries are trying to limit the amount of uh, information that is flowing into China, or perhaps the technology knowledge. What is driving the innovation in China? Yeah, well, well I feel like export control. Well, I think part of the reason will be export control, right? Like export control, essentially, you cut a lot of potential technology that you know Chinese customers can potentially assess. And that, you know, drives sort of motivation for them to develop their own technology, right? But remember, behind that, before the for control, there's also the motivation to, to develop their own semiconductor supply chain. So I think kind of multi uh, factors here playing, right? But I do think as for control in many ways do accelerate a lot of innovations and a lot of motivation to develop uh, advanced technology. But it's also important to note it that uh, there's already the a lot of policies behind, you know, the big fund one, right? Like, there's already a lot of policies behind Chinese self-sufficiency pursuit. Um, Stephen, in, what is your take on what is driving the innovation in China? Is this coming from, uh, if we take a deeper look into the country itself, is this coming from government initiatives or government uh, trying to push companies to, to get to that level? Or is there a certain amount of I, I'm trying to understand what is happening within that ecosystem, if you have any insight into it. Well, Chinese Premier Xi Jinping has said, quote, technological innovation has become the main battleground of the global playing field and international competition is increasingly fierce. You know, China recognizes that we live in a global digital economy uh, economists estimate that over the next decade, uh, nearly half of all value created in the global economy will be created digitally, be created through tools like artificial intelligence, um, the ability to uh, extract actionable insight and intelligence from information in real time across a variety of sectors. So China recognizes that in this digital economy, by definition, semiconductors are the foundation of this entire global system. Um, and so they want to remediate a deficit, uh, both in terms of trade, uh, but also in terms of domestic capabilities. So, um, you know, there aren't two more important industries for China than semiconductors and artificial intelligence, which they see as increasingly going hand in hand with what Xi Jinping calls the new productive forces of the economy. Uh, so that's why they're making such critical investments in this field. And it should be reiterated, China had put these strategies in place in 2014, well before there was virtually any kind of export control that the United States had imposed on the country. So there is nothing the U.S. policy has done to uh, uh, the push China down this uh, path towards desired self-sufficiency. Uh, this has been part of the Chinese game plan for some time. How the export controls maybe accelerated? Has the weaponized interdependence uh, uh, made them understand the stakes of the game? Yeah, you could argue that. But our export controls haven't fundamentally induced or changed their strategy. And you touched on this earlier, Stephen, but if I could get you to, to expand a little bit on, on, on the idea is uh, no semiconductor is an island, basically, uh, g given the, all the, this entire ecosystem pulls on this incredibly complex network. Can you, can you just explain how, what, what, what the challenge would be then for China, uh, even if it does develop its own chip or chip manufacturing uh, base? Uh, in kind of drawing in all that network that goes into making a single chip. Stephen. Well, to replicate every single part of the semiconductor research and 
design and software and equipment and tooling process as a domestic enterprise is, you know, an attempt to replicate, you know, 80 years of globalized technology development in this field. And it, uh, you know, I think it's potentially an overreach for the Chinese government. I I think what they want is, well, I, I use the term satisficing. What they want uh, in many advanced tech sectors, uh, the ability to replace foreign with domestic inputs and final products that, you know, are probably 80% is good, but at 70% the cost in a lot of these sectors. It, it's a win for China if they decrease foreign dependency. Now, they'll take our NVIDIA chips at the leading edge, so long as they are at the global leading edge and there's not a credible or viable domestic competitor to replace it. But let's be absolutely clear, in any of these technology sectors, when there's a credible Chinese company that can supplant a foreign competitor, we, what we say to ITF is that uh, China's economic strategy has involved from uh, attraction to a compulsion to expulsion. Uh, and um, what we see in uh, places um, like, you know, cloud computing, if they have a credible domestic competitor, then the foreign competitors are kicked out. So, um, well, it, it also should be noted that China's strategy in this sector and many others is fundamentally not WTO compliant. This is not what the country signed up to when it joined um, a global trade organization predicated upon the principles of national treatment, reciprocity, and discrimination. Uh, China is playing an economic game that is fundamentally predicated on mercantilism and uh, not on uh, fair global trading with partners. Um, so we have to be wise to the nature of how they're trying to compete in this sector, like many of their high-tech sectors. Okay, and finally, Ray, uh, if I could get you to kind of just look ahead a little bit, uh, in about five years' time, where do you see China's chip sector? Where do you see China's chip manufacturing? And how should, uh, what, what should Taiwan be looking at? Yeah, I think, well, I think for Taiwan, I, I, I don't think in the next five years, Chinese, you know, foundries can catch up companies like TSMC. I think it will be still very difficult given the advantage that uh, TSMC have ranging from technology le leadership, customer relationship, uh, equipment, right? Um, and all other stuff, if you put in together, I think it's very, very hard for Chinese companies to catch up TSMC. I think for Taiwan, I think the most concerning part for me, it's the impact of legacy chips, especially for companies like UMC, uh, power chips, uh, you name it. Right? I think those companies are the ones that will be on the front line to be impacted by Chinese semiconductor industry, especially I think given the capacity build up we are seeing right now, that will actually translate it in the capacity in 2026, 2027, and 2028. So I will say the full impacts of Chinese legacy chip build up haven't fully arrived yet. I think it will actually arrive maybe two years from now because a lot of the capacity build up is actually ongoing process, right? And the capacity will really translate it in the next two years given the, the timeline for building the fabs and the customer, you know, ordering the you know tap the wafers order in those foundries in China. I think till then, if Taiwan couldn't have sort of other strategy to kind of navigate this capacity and price competition in legacy chip market, uh, I think it will be very problem problem problematic for Taiwanese uh, legacy chip foundry uh, to compete. And that's the thing concerning me the most. Thank you both so much, Stephen Ezel, Ray Wang, for joining us from Washington, D.C.